for life for the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul and i read a simpler version there for the sake of others verse 11 i'm going to read the niv it says um, for the life of a creature is in the blood and i have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar for it is the blood that makes atonement for a life for one's life now the first thing and, and i'm going to give you as always seven key points to take away concerning when we understand the blood of jesus um, blood represents life we learn in scripture and this specific scripture actually teaches us that the life of a, a thing a creature is in the blood and you will find that in the whole theme of the bible that the blood was the key topic of the whole bible right from the beginning until the end it was always issues of blood right to the book of revelations we still read about blood we start with blood in the book of genesis um, my studies concerning blood are one of the most incredible things you have ever learned about blood. Um, some people that teach in, in, in certain types of healing or certain types of studies teach us that actually blood by, by its natural color is not red. That blood is light. It is light literally flowing into, in your veins. However, when it is exposed, it becomes um, red. They taught that even Adam at... Um, at his peak at the glory of god when he had a glorified body he did not have blood in his veins but he actually had light and it would come out as light some of these things are are neither here nor say they don't affect your salvation they're not essential to the process of salvation but the one thing that we understand is that the whole focus the whole theme of the bible is about blood and when we get an understanding of that we understand that the first person to shed blood after Adam and Eve's sin was God. So God was essentially the first person to shed blood because the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, God killed an animal and he took the coat, the skin, the, the fur, and he made a, a coat to cover their nakedness with. So the first time blood was shed, blood was shed to cover someone's sin. So... The problem is, even though blood was shed in that time, he, he then realizes that blood is shed every time there is a process of redemption and every time there is a show of mercy, we have, there has to be a shedding of blood. And this is why in many instances and in many contexts, in many cultures across the world, blood is one of the most sacred things in the world. You can never really have a relationship with someone that doesn't include blood. That's why children, when children are born, blood must be shed. Something must happen at every key moment of redemption and mercy, and it begins with blood. The problem with the blood of animals, though, was that the blood of animals was inferior. The blood of animals could not take away sin. The blood of animals could only cover sin. So what God does, even in the book of Leviticus that we are speaking, after man has sinned, the God says that for the the life of a thing is in the blood and it will provide atonement but atonement not in in taking away but in covering what god was saying is i want to find a way to not see your sin so the blood of animals was placed over us so that god could really just hide the sin that you had because he had not yet provided a plan for redemption i hope you're with me so now what he realizes then is he has to shed the blood of something that is valuable and he has to shed the blood of something that is meaningful. And there we see for the first time that God then provides Jesus to shed his own blood for us. Now the reason why it's important, this is important, is because blood that is sinful cannot save you, number one, and blood that is pure can save you so atonement can only come when a high priest we read this in scripture takes the blood of a lamb why is he taking the blood of a lamb because it is blameless it has not sinned yet and then he has to take it to the altar and he has to use this blood so your sins had to be put on an animal that had no fault whatsoever in the same sense, when we go back to the, to the beginning in, book, in, the book, in the book of Genesis, when you're reading the book of Genesis, it teaches us that God sheds an animal. This animal was not part of what Adam and Eve did. This animal was busy chilling there and God chose this animal and he killed it in, in order to, to shift the sins of a man 
to this innocent creature. So essentially we begin to understand that God himself institutes the first time when blood, the blood of an innocent was shed for you. This should actually teach you about the love of God. The reason why it's important for us to understand the love of God is because the, the fact that God would go as far as to shift blame from you to someone or something else and then inflict punishment on this thing for your sake means he loves you enough to break his own rules. The greatest revelation of the Bible should be that God loves you so much that he went out of his way to put blame on things that did not sin for your sake. Starting first with innocent animals, lambs that didn't done anything but they were chosen and they had to be killed so that his anger would not be directed at you and so that your sin may be hidden. Come on guys, talk to me. This is love. So when we begin to see this, we begin to see that the blood of an animal has to be taken. This was done so that the innocence of this animal could be transferred to you and your sin would be transferred to the animal. Are you with me? So this is why it is important that this blood be innocent. Why? Because if he did this exchange with an animal that was actually sinful or with a person that was actually sinful, there would simply be an exchange. You would get their sin and they get yours. And all sin leads to death, so it doesn't matter what it is. So in the Old Testament, the priest would only use this blood of a spotless animal for sacrifices. Jesus then becomes the seed of the Holy Spirit and this, as the seed of his, not of his, of, of, J, of Joseph because the problem was Jesus could not be born with the blood of man. Let me say that differently. Now, when God begins to come and he says, okay, I want to give redemption to man, the thing is he could not then give you a person who was born of a man. Why is that important? Because science teaches us that the blood of a, a man mixes with a child. Right? In scientifically, when you are pregnant, your blood, your own blood does not mix with the baby. So there's no mix of that DNA in any way. And the only blood that mixes with a child is the blood of the man. Now, the problem is, if Jesus is born from Joseph, Jesus will be born with the sins of Joseph. He is born and there's a transfer of the problems of that generation shared on to him. So what has to be done is God had no choice, but he had to make sure that even though he is born of a woman, which validates his humanity, he had to make sure that the blood of Joseph never touches Jesus. Because then the problem becomes, if you have a savior who is born, who has issues from his father's lineage, we actually just replicate what we are. Because every tree bears after its own kind. So if your father is sinful, then you are sinful. So it was necessary then that the Holy Spirit had to come to Joseph and say, do not touch Mary because we don't want your blood to mix with this stuff. Can you imagine a God who struggles with human issues? Who struggles with lusts? Who, who struggles with certain things in the bloodline. And so it is important then that Jesus belonged to the tribe of Judah, but also very important that he must not have the blood of Judah. Because the sin is in the blood. The life is in the blood. Now Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10 to 14 says that the blood of Jesus was shed for once for all and the blood washed away our sins. So Jesus then becomes the last Adam. What does this mean? I was born with the blood of Adam. I was born with the sins of Adam. I was born with the struggles of Adam. All the sins, the, the frustrations of the blood that is within Adam was in me. So Jesus had to become another Adam to give birth to a new generation of people. This is why when you are born again, we say you are born again. It's a new birth because you were born first under the bloodline of Adam, but now you are being translated or you are being reborn under the blood of Jesus. Oh, guys, I hope you're with me. What does this mean? This means there's a transfer from the bloodline and the struggles of Adam, and then we are brought in into the transfer of the, of the, the blessings and the glory in the blood of Jesus. So it is imperative and it is important that Christians understand number one, the saving ability of the blood of Jesus because the blood of Adam can only speak sinful because it was it, in itself it is sinful. This is why nobody teaches us to do bad stuff. 
This is why nobody teaches us to, do, to be sinful. Nobody taught you the things that you did when you were young or even now. Nobody gave you lessons. Come on church, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you never got lessons. We've made decisions in our lives that are purely because of the blood that is within us. But the blood of Jesus then reminds us or brings us back into the innocence of the blood of Jesus. Why? There is now a transfer. What was sinful in me, I give to him. What is innocent and pure in him, he gives to me. Talk to me. Now, the book of Revelations then teaches us now that um, through the blood of Jesus, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I'm going to talk about now. When we speak the blood of Jesus, it then gives me victory. Why? Because scripture teaches us that the blood of Abel calls for justice, but the blood of Jesus speaks an entirely different message. Because of the innocence of the blood of Jesus, when we begin to speak it and appropriate it, most of us then begin to have victory because for you it speaks blessing. For you it speaks healing. For you it speaks growth. It speaks increase. Your bloodline speaks death. Why? Because it carries sin. Your bloodline speaks failure because it carries sin. Your bloodline speaks depression, sickness, and all these things. Why? Because it carries sin. So the key, and this is important, when we have a revelation of the blood of Jesus, we begin to understand that then applying this blood gives us everything that the blood speaks. Oh my gosh. We see this again in the book of Exodus. If you, have, if you need a scripture, chapter 12, verse 12. The, the children of Israel are in, in, in Egypt and God is about to deliver them. And he, he begins, this is the beginning of what we call the Passover, which is uh, the, the slaughter of the firstborn sons in Egypt. Most of us know this story. The Bible then teaches us that at that point, that they were supposed to put blood on the, on the lamb of their doorposts. And then he says something. He says, whenever I see the blood, I will pass over you. So that night, as the angel of death is coming through and sweeping through, they were preserved at every single door that had blood on it. Now, understand this. If you were an Israelite and you did not put blood on your doorposts, there would be death in your house. So it is not about being a Christian that just really works for you. There has to be an application of the blood of Jesus. Talk to me. For most people, when we go through stuff, the first thing that we want to do is we want to just talk about the blood. Oh yes, the blood of Jesus is there, but we do not apply it. So he says to them that obviously you have the blood, you have the lamb, you have everything. But here's the deal. If you apply it, I will walk over. So it is imperative then that when we, we have the blood of Jesus, it needs application. Talk to me. It needs application. So the blood of Jesus averts judgment. Through the blood of Jesus, I, I avert judgment. It stops the destroyer. The blood of Jesus averts punishment. Through it, all kinds of destruction passes over me. So when it's sickness, it passes over because it has no power where blood is applied. His blood guarantees me life by allowing certain things to pass over. Now, we have taught this many times in churches, but we have not emphasized the need for us to daily plead the blood of Jesus in our lives. You need to plead the blood of Jesus. You need to apply the blood of Jesus over your health, over your ministry, over your possessions, over your children. Make it a rule to never go to bed before pleading the blood of Jesus. Over your life, the first thing you do in the morning, I plead the blood of Jesus over my health, I plead the blood of Jesus over my loved ones, because the blood of Jesus then is protective. Amen. It's protective. Through it we attain victory. The blood of Jesus speaks for our innocence. It speaks for your victory. It speaks for your protection. Now I want you to understand this. The reason why judgment passes over you is because the Bible is strict about the rule that God instituted, which is that judgment does not belong to the innocent. So in the innocence of the blood that you have over your life, it is a violation for sickness to come into your life when you are innocent. Oh, I hope you get this. Stay with me. 
This is one of the greatest revelations of all time. If we master this and understand it, it will break us free in certain things in our lives. Poverty is a violation of my covenant under the blood of Jesus. Amen. The reason why this is important, Jesus says that the enemy, the, the, the prince of this world is coming. But he will, don't worry, he will not have victory over me. Why will he not have victory over me? Does anybody know that scripture? He goes on to say, because he has nothing, there is nothing of him in me. There is no impurity in me. There is no sin in me. And because of the innocence and the nature of Christ already in us, we are innocent. We are, we are blameless. That same innocent creates a covenant that is protective over your life against certain things. It becomes protective over you. If you get this, guys, the way you pray is going to change. Because this is, this is one of the things that Bishop shares about a lot and Bishop emphasizes this a lot to understand this righteousness. To say, because I am the righteousness of Christ, because I am pure, because I am innocent, there are certain things that have no place in my life by the law that God has set. Things like sickness, things like poverty, things like struggle have no power over you. They have to pass over because of the innocence brought by the blood. So our general daily life must meditate and must be built around the application of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Come on, say yes. yes. Number two, number two, the blood of Jesus washes away sin. That's that innocence we are talking about. It is the purity that we receive through the blood of Jesus. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So the blood of Jesus comes in to do complete purification of our lives. There is an emptying, there is a pour out that re removes all blemishes, all sin, all stuff. Anything in your life that you have done, anything in your life that you have done is nullified and cancelled by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Now imagine you have domestos. I'm not brand, I'm not, they're not paying me for this, so, so maybe let's not... It's just the brand I know, okay? So, the blood of Jesus then becomes the heavenly agent that purposes and cleans ungodliness out of us and then brings us into the eternal legacy of God. It is Jesus' own domestos, right? What's the best detergent you know, ladies? Okay, domestos. All right, sure. So, the blood of people is ruined by iniquity and the sins of our father. Now, I say father, but it's fathers. Our blood is impure and sinful. We struggle with defilement. A lot of us have been defiled by the things we've done, things we've seen, the demonic habits that are in our blood, the mistakes of our fathers. Do you know that your body, your blood currently contains every sin that your father has ever made? Every bad decision they made, everything they did at some place where, where it is written in your blood. This is what it says. When the Bible says that the life of a thing is in the blood, it means the history, the legacy, the mileage of a thing is in the blood. Which means every single sin committed by your father and your forefathers if in every generation is written in your blood. There is defilement. There are demonic habits that are in the blood from the mistakes of our fathers. The blood of Jesus then is pure and holy. It is spotless and sinless. So at the confession of my faith, when I begin to apply this blood, I receive what we call a transfusion of his blood. Stay with me. I receive a transfusion and I receive blood that is sinless and the blood that flows out of the mercy seat of God from a sinless lamp is received and injected into my body. What does this mean? The blood of Jesus purifies me from the iniquity in my blood and it washes away the history and the presence of sin. What it means then is Jesus forgets, God forgets every sin that your father ever committed from the beginning. Get it? Get this with me. The problem with the blood of animals is that it removes me from sin. It covers my sin for now. This is why when we read this in scripture, we understand that they had to put a sacrifice every other week to come back and put another sacrifice. Why was that important? Because you can only cover sin for so long. Now the blood of Jesus then, when I get that transfusion of this blood, now what it does is it removes the history and the presence of sin. 
So what does it mean? Every sin I have committed until right now is nullified. Every sin that I have currently on me now, whether from my forefathers or from myself, is cancelled and nullified. It means I am completely sinless. Christians, hear me. You are sinless. There is no sin in you. It gives you then the power to say no to the curse in the blood. We said this last time that our own bloodline creates tendencies, what we call iniquity, what, we, what causes us to do what we want. Paul says that the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. But the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. So you can say, I want to be a good person today. I want to be a good man, a good husband, a good wife today. Today I want to be a good Christian, but still at the end of the day, like, ish, I failed. Why is it hard for us to do this? Because of the blood in your veins. But now when you get this blood, the blood of Jesus, and it's beginning to work in your life, it then gives you the ability to say no, because you are now of a different bloodline. You see, all candemities do candemity things. Are you listening to me? There are certain features that define anyone who is candemity. There are certain eyes that they have and certain things that they do. Those features are bound to the bloodline and they have no, you have no choice. You can't control what you are. So, I mean, you could be candemity, but you want little eyes like Chinese eyes. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? Because the bloodline speaks louder. Talk to me. Talk to me. Now you can walk around like this, it's fine if you want. But the bottom line is when you open them, they open wide. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because the bloodline dictates behavior. So when we are under the blood of our, our, own, our own blood, this blood that we have received from our forefathers, what it means is that no matter what we do, we produce what is within us. Those eyes will keep coming out. You can't control it. When you are brought under the lineage of the blood of Jesus, what happens now is I have control over it. I'm a new creation. All things have what? Behold, all things have become new. So now what's changed is the nature that is in me and I have the power to say no. What it does is it separates me from the generational bondage that comes through the bloodline. So the same curse and the same sin that haunted and circulated in my bloodline that resulted in demonic inheritances is broken and then we find and, and we are brought into freedom in Christ through the blood. So I have the power then to end the legacy of the bloodline. Listen to me and listen very carefully. Now when we begin to appropriate and apply the blood of Jesus, what we are doing is we are in the mission of canceling the power of bloodlines. You guys have no idea how powerful some of our bloodlines are. Now, we see the manifestation of this when deliverance is being done and people are praying concerning certain things and then people are, are dealing with repetitions and patterns in their bloodlines and in their ancestry. But the truth is, of the matter is some of us have not been careful to deal with everything in our bloodline. Jesus wants to deliver us from the power of the bloodline. What does this mean? That means hereditary sicknesses can end. That means patterns can end. We don't have to do what our parents did. We don't have to fail where they failed. We don't have to stop where they stopped. Some of us have these things over our families by which we can never grow beyond what we were, what our mother and fathers were. And we are stuck in the cycle of, what, of, of the patterns of our generations. And that blood of Jesus begins to give us freedom. Let me give you scriptures quickly. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 25. Romans 3, 24 to 25. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7 as well. Okay, my time is really bad, so I'm going to run through what we want to do, and I want to pray. I want us to do prayers, declarations um, concerning the blood of Jesus. Number three, point number three, the blood of Jesus gives me access. The blood of Jesus gives me access. The blood of Jesus gives me access. In the Old Testament, God only spoke to a few people. So you had to be special chosen for you to be used or 
for you to work with God. Now, we, we read this in scripture. It teaches us that the priests, the high priest, and only one person would go in the Holy of Holies to present an offering before God. And then he would bring the blood of animals. The purpose of this blood was to hide the sin of man so that he would allow him to be in the presence of God so much that the high priest himself had to apply the blood of an animal on himself. Scripture teaches us that if there was any part of his body that was not covered by the blood, this person would actually die. Why? If you forgot a spot, and you know there are certain spots that are easy to forget behind the ears and so forth. If you forgot a spot, just one place in your body that is not covered by the blood, and the judgment of God sees that spot, then you would die. In many times, and I believe many instances, people would be then be pulled. They would have to go in with bells attached to their garment. We're going to talk about the priestly garment in the future and the tabernacle of Moses. We're going to talk about that. But they would have to wear a, a long garment. And at the bottom of the garment, they had to put pomegranates and bells, little bells. So when I am walking, they can hear, tsk, 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 tsk. as soon as I stop, if they hear that for five minutes there has not been a sound, then they know that Guidance walked in there without properly covering himself with the blood of Jesus, with the blood of this animal, sorry. As a result of that, then they would have to pull me. So I would go into the Holy of Holies with a rope on my ankle so that in the event that I die, they can pull me out. Why? Nobody wants to go in there to get you if you died in there. So the problem is then, God reserved a certain amount of his power and presence only to people that were under this specific covering, people of the priesthood. Now when we have this, we understand then that every other person in the world could not go before the throne of God because they did not have the blood. Because they were not chosen. Now when Jesus sheds the blood, the first thing that we understand in scripture is that there was a tear in the veil. The reason why this tear mattered and the reason why it was important is because suddenly what used to be hidden from you is now open. The rule of a door, and hear me, the rule of a door is that the door opens us to the realm of worlds. Talk to me. Every door opens a certain world to us. As long as the door is open, that world is accessible. The problem with a veil is a veil that big, a veil that thick, is that it stops us from getting access into the tabernacle, into the presence of God, because it disqualifies us. And it says that some people have no right into the presence of God. This thing is still being taught by certain people that if you, in order for you to get access to God, you need to go through prophet what what. In order for you to get a certain breakthrough, you need to come through me. That I will, I, I will hook you up with the presence of God because you know I'm the one who chills with Jesus. Now, here's the key. When Jesus sheds his blood, the veil is torn and suddenly the realm of the Holy of Holies is opened so that we can now get access to it. If the door is open, then anyone who walks through it has access to it, right? So the blood of Jesus covers us and it allows us to stand in the presence of God in the same way that Aaron could stand in the Holy of Holies. Oh, I hope you are listening to me right now. So this blood is better because unlike the blood of animals which covered sins, the blood of Jesus completely removes it. It allows me then to stand in the presence of God, in the full heaviness of God, without ever having to be afraid about my sinful state. Why? Because the sin is gone. It allows you to commune with God, to relate with God. You don't need a special robe. You don't need a special title. You don't need a special anointing. You don't need a special type of oil to go into the presence of God. You have full access to God and God's anger will not rise against you. You see, in the African culture, we've always believed that God is angry at us. As soon as things start going wrong in our lives, we think God is upset. Eh, hey, the ancestors, God is unhappy. We need to appease God. So we always have this default thought that God is an upset with you. Can I tell you something this morning? God is not angry with you. God is angry at sin. His judgment is stirred against sin. Now, when you are under the blood, there is no sin. The history, the presence of sin has been removed completely. So when you stand in the presence of God, and this is a problem because certain Christians always think God is upset with them. He's not. He's not angry at you. Come on, church. Number four, 
My time is up. I have five minutes left. So I'm going to breeze through this. The blood of Jesus gives us victory. Victory through the blood. Everything we need in life for our victory, for our healing, for our deliverance, all things that we need. Protection and authority, fellowship, redemption has been given to us through the blood of Jesus. Write this down. Everything I need, everything I need, everything I need has been provided to me through the blood of Jesus. It is tragic when a Christian doesn't know the power of the blood. There is no greater tragedy than a Christian who doesn't know the power of the blood of Jesus. So, what do we get? Isaiah 53 verse 5, number 1. I get healing through the blood of Jesus. I get healing through the blood of Jesus. Jesus carried all our spiritual torment, our sins, our mental anxieties and distresses, our cares, our sorrows, our fears, our physical pain, our sicknesses and diseases. The Bible says then he's, by his stripes he bore, he, he, he bore and the blood he shed for our healing. By his stripes we are healed. Notice the tense that says we are healed, not we were healed. Your, your healing is not past in the past. It's not an event that happened in the past. Your healing is an event that is happening now. Talk to me. So we were not healed. We are healed. Healing is now. Are you with me? My healing is now. Number two, the blood of Jesus gives me authority over the devil. Authority over the devil. We have victory through the blood of Jesus. The purpose and the agenda of the enemy is to make sure you as a Christian never go to understand the power that you have through the blood. You see, there are certain things that you want to keep from people so they never discover what they are. I always tell you the story of the slaves, that the slave masters for three years kept news away from the slaves that they were free. Someone worked for three years for someone with no pay, being beaten, being abused simply because they did not have information about their freedom so the devil wants to keep you from that revelation chapter 12 verse 11 revelations 12 verse 11 so we have to confront the 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 demonic manifestations through dreams i'm going to give you a solution to those people that struggle with this if you have demonic dreams, generational curses, bloodline curses, witchcraft, spiritual spouses eating in your dreams, you have to declare your victory through the blood of Jesus. Should I say that list again? So we're talking about generational curses. We're talking about bloodline curses. We're talking about witchcraft, manifestations of witchcraft in any form. We're talking about spiritual spouses. We're talking about those things like eating in your dreams. We're talking about demonic attacks. All that stuff, can, you can have victory. You have victory through the blood of Jesus. It is powerful. So what is the key? You apply it, number one. You declare it. And you walk in it by faith. And number three is uh, protection through the blood of Jesus. We get protection through the blood of Jesus. Same point. Every type of protection you're going to have in your life from God is going to come through the blood. Are you with me? That's what we said. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So this situation has not changed. Whoever has applied the blood has protection. So do not start your day without the blood of Jesus. Do not start your week without the blood of Jesus. Apply it in your relationship, in any context, on, on, on your children, and so forth. And number five, number five, the next point. Uh, we are past that, that, that uh, point. The blood of Jesus is speaking. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. The blood of Jesus is speaking. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. And the blood that has been sprinkled, this blood that has been sprinkled, speaks a better covenant, a better word than the blood of Abel. Hallelujah. The human beings call for justice. Our blood loves justice. In fact, it's not even justice for us. Uh, our, our humanity calls for, for um, what's the word? 
we want to make sure that what's been done to us is done to someone else. Thank you, vengeance. We want to make sure there's revenge. We want to make sure that if I'm suffering, someone else must suffer. It is naturally how we are inclined. Now, when the blood of Jesus comes, it then speaks life, whereas my blood speaks vengeance. So what we have, we have, we have Abel, who is in the ground, who has been killed by his brother, and his blood is calling from the earth. What is he saying from the earth? This man killed me, I want vengeance. This is tragic because if you read scripture, God says to, to him that the, I hear the blood of your brother calling to me from the earth. Why is it calling? It's saying there is injustice, you need to have vengeance for me. Now, we have often dismissed certain things in the African culture because we think African, everything African is wrong. But even in the African culture, we are taught very strongly about things like Ngozi. Now, these things are taught that blood is speaking from the earth because somebody kills someone, there is a sense of justice. The blood is speaking vengeance against a certain family because of an injustice that was done. This has never been more true in our generation than in any other time. Listen to me. Every blood that is shed of a man calls for vengeance. Our blood wants to have revenge. It wants to make sure there's, there's an equilibrium that has been achieved. And that ultimately creates disfavor for you because any blood that was shed in any time, in any zone, calls against you, even though you didn't do it. That's the problem, isn't it? That the blood of man calls for vengeance on people that did not do anything. To, that You were not part of this process. You didn't do this thing. But the blood is calling for vengeance against your life. Huh, guys, I hope we're, we're together. I hope I'm not skipping people here. Now, here's the key then. When we, are, when we are in the world, the world is calling for cruelty. It demands balance and repatriation of all good things and bad things. Now, some people call it karma. Some people call it an eye for an eye. Some people call it justice. But the truth of the matter is, we are all punished for our sins, including sins we did not commit. I mean, when a new child is born, this is scriptural, when a child is born, they are born in sin. They didn't commit sin. Their fathers did. So all kinds of blood calls for justice even when you did not do anything wrong. Because you were in your father when the sin was committed. This is the key we must understand. We were all within Adam when Adam committed this sin. So we were all involuntary volunteers to the process of sin. By so doing, we are judged by things we have never done in our lives. A child that has just been born two minutes ago is sinful. Hear me, church. So what happens then is this blood calls for justice, but then Jesus becomes the new mediator. Under the blood of your forefathers, there is judgment leveled against you that you can't do anything with, but under the blood of Jesus, there is now mediation. What does a mediator do? They come on your behalf and say, but God, this judgment that you are trying to speak on this person is unjust. According to your word and according to this promise, you said anyone who applies this blood is free from punishment. So what does this mean? This person must be freed from it. And so the blood of Jesus begins now to negotiate. Oh my God, my God. <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish we could really unfold certain words in the depth of what they mean. Because essentially then, what it means is that when every other thing in your own bloodline, your own ancestors are not speaking for you, your ancestors are speaking to accuse you. In the African culture, we were taught that our ancestors stand before us, before God. That's not true. They can't. Your ancestors are speaking against you. Because there is no good in blood, in our blood. It is faulty. It is accusatory. It demands justice. So your blood, your ancestry is standing against you. And your blood one day will speak against your children. Because what will it say? It will say you were sinful. It will say you did that. It will, say, it will mention all the bad things that you have ever done. The blood then that can redeem you is the blood of Jesus. And how does it do that? By speaking a better word. Forgiveness. Mercy. Promise. Hallelujah.